The Trump administration's policy towards transgender members of the military is the subject of our commentary from Charlotte Clymer, a press secretary at the Human Rights Campaign. As a military veteran and proud transgender woman, the Trump administration's attempted ban on transgender people in the military hits home for me. It's personal. For over three years, I carried caskets in Arlington National Cemetery. I folded American flags for loved ones. I ceremoniously unloaded transfer cases of the remains of our fallen warriors in uniform, being carried home from Iraq and Afghanistan to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Every casket and transfer case I carried was covered by an American flag, every single one. And that is all I remember about any of them. I never knew their race. I never knew their religion or education or birthplace. I didn't know their political party or who they voted for. I didn't know what music they liked or their guilty pleasure movie or what they did with their friends on the last Saturday night in their hometown before shipping out to war. I'll never know the names of their parents and spouses and children. I'll never know the intimate details of their personal lives. I'll never know who they loved and how they saw themselves in the world. All I know about those I carried was that they died in selfless service and they wore the flag of this country to the grave. No one at Dover Air Force Base or Arlington National Cemetery asked if those we buried were secretly transgender. It didn't matter then, and it certainly doesn't matter now. The lies perpetuated about transgender people serving in the military have been thoroughly debunked and rejected by medical experts, by budget analysts, by military generals and admirals, by the vast majority of the American people, and not least, by history of Americans who have been barred from service and proved bigots wrong. They barred men of color, they barred women, they barred gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. We have been at this intersection of fear, cynicism, and outright ignorance many times. And we are always reminded that the only true threats to our country's strength are hatred and an absence of character. And yet, even while all this takes place, there are thousands of openly transgender service members, trained professionals, some of the best and brightest our military has to offer, serving right now, many of them in combat zones. Despite the stress and anxiety from a commander-in-chief who has no faith in them, a commander-in-chief who himself never served a single day in uniform, they continue to meet the highest standards of excellence. Given all this, I have to ask my fellow Americans, is this what we want our beloved country to stand for? <clears throat> Charlotte Clymer is currently the press secretary for rapid response at the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest civil rights organization dedicated to advancing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer equality. Her day-to-day -day work involves running the organization's messaging in response to the White House and federal policy. She also serves on the DC Commission for Persons with Disabilities, the Board of Directors for the Center for Law and Military Policy, the Military and Veterans Advisory Council for Modern Military Families of America, and the Advisory Councils for Running Start and the Lone Star Parity Project, organizations working towards gender parity in elected office. She is also a political partner in the class of 2019 at the Truman National Security Project, which works to bring together leaders with national security backgrounds to de deliver concrete solutions to pressing global challenges for leaders at the local, state, and national levels. Her commentary has been quoted by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Guardian, Time, Newsweek, and numerous other publications. Her work has been published in the Washington Post, NBC News, GQ, The Independent, Courts, Dame Magazine, and others. She is a 2019 40 Under 40 Career Woman of DC honoree and a graduate of Georgetown University. She is a Texan, a military veteran, and a proud transgender woman currently based in Washington, DC. She's here as the summer reading program speaker and will be speaking to some of the themes in the book This Is How It Always Is by Lori Frankel. So please help me in welcoming Charlotte Clymer. Mess out the clock here. I've been told I have 25 minutes to explain gender theory. <laughs> Should be easy. All right, one second. There we go. 
Well, good morning, folks. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here at the Taft School. Your reputation precedes you. This is an incredible institution that has produced so many great people. Uh, and it is just an unquestionable honor uh, to speak here today. Uh, uh, last night, the chaplain took me around the grounds, and I was caught by not only the beauty of the campus, but also the history. Um, especially all the names that are etched on the walls of past graduates. I mean, you are part of a long line of folks who have given public service to this country, and that's something to be proud of and something to aspire to. Um, like I said, I only have 25 minutes today, 30 minutes if I'm really good. Uh, and I want to answer a few questions for you, three questions, in fact. Um, the first one that I want to address is whether or not being transgender or gay or bisexual or lesbian or queer in general is a choice, because it's not. And I'll get to that in a second. The second one is whether being transgender is a mental illness, because it's not, and I'll talk about that. And the third is why should we care about this? Because there are folks uh, in this country who will look at LGBTQ issues and trans issues in particular and wonder, I thought this was over. I thought this fight was long done why should I give a damn? So we're going to talk about that today. Um, I grew up in Central Texas. I'm from a uh, two long lines of Southern white folks, very poor, impoverished, abusive family, broken home. Uh, one side's from Kentucky, the other side is from Texas and Oklahoma. And I knew from a very early age that something was different about me. I didn't know how to articulate it. You know, being, you know, back then in the 90s, being gay was uh, certainly stigmatized enough, uh, but being transgender was a whole another topic of discussion that people rarely, if ever, discussed. So I didn't really have adults in my life who I could talk to. Uh, and so my solution to dealing with being transgender and knowing that I wanted uh, to be a girl or woman, or knowing that inside I was a girl or woman, uh, is that I uh, basically just did everything I could to deny it and beat it out of myself. I was a really good kid. I um, you know, got good grades and you know, played football in high school and middle school. I was actually pretty good. Um, uh, I ended up uh, joining the military. I went through all these masculine rites of passage with one goal in mind, being a better person, of course, but number two, eradicating this need inside of me uh, to be someone else, um, the true person that I am, that is. Uh, I want to take you real quick through a few disclaimers before I launch into that, though. Um, I am transgender, and I face discrimination and violence, uh, but I'm also, oh, I'm a white person, I'm able-bodied, I am not a religious minority, I happen to be a Christian, I have access to health care, I'm financially secure, and I have a very large microphone. Uh, those of you who may or may not uh, follow me on social media may see my commentary, um, I can reach a very lar large audience in a short period of time. You know, most people in this country can't do that, especially those in marginalized communities, and on and on and on. And the reason I say all this is because oppression in one identity does not absolve our allyship in another. You know, I am a trans woman, but I also have white privilege. I uh, have Christian privilege. I have able-bodied privilege. These are things that I have to confront as an individual and make sure that I'm being a good ally to everyone in a marginalized community. And it's not just the things that we usually hear about. It's also those who are oppressed in ways that are sometimes not talked about that often. You know, the white male coal miner in West Virginia who is seeing uh, his mind shut down or displaced or uh, basically overridden with uh, public policy officials who, you know, maybe are not so considerate. You know, that is someone who needs help. And in this country, if we believe in the values of inclusion and community, we help those who are in need. We help those who are being left behind. It doesn't matter who they are. So it's not just the traditional categories of race, gender, and sexuality. It's everyone who faces some kind of obstacle in their day-to-day -day life. Um, another disclaimer real quick. I am just one transgender person. I don't speak for the entire community. Uh, I, you know, even if it were a, another white transgender woman from Central Texas, I would not speak for her either. Uh, this is especially true for trans women of color who are overwhelmingly targeted with violence and discrimination in this country. 21 trans people have been murdered this year in the United States. 20 of them are black trans women. 
Last year it was 26 trans people, the year before that it was 29. The vast majority of those were black trans women. Black trans women and black non-binary people are overwhelmingly targeted with violence and discrimination. And so it's very important that we look at the intersection of white supremacy uh, with transphobia, homophobia, misogyny, et cetera. So um, there are two definitions of transgender. Uh, the one is the popular one, right? We think of transgender as a, a man becoming a woman or a woman becoming a man. That's a very problematic term, obviously. Uh, but there is the other definition, which is the academic one. It's basically anyone who falls outside of what we perceive as the normal gender identity and expressions. Um, we call this the trans umbrella. Oh, let me see. There we go. Uh, and this includes everyone. I mean, this is uh, uh, persons who may not identify, uh, you know, aside from uh, their sex or gender assigned at birth, uh, but, uh, you know, may cross-dress. Or drag queens, for example, are technically part of the transgender community, as we define it in academia. Um, and so that's very important to remember. Um, let me see. Uh, make sure this is all good. This is a big one. Gender identity is not sexual orientation. Two separate concepts. Gender identity, uh, excuse me, sexual orientation is uh, who you love or your romantic or sexual involvement with another person, right? It's how you're oriented in the world romantically and sexually. Gender identity is how you express yourself to the world in terms of gender. And it's very important to remember that because often there will be a conflation between, for example, gay men and transgender women that's completely separate. You know, just taking trans women, for example, trans women can be attracted to men, can be attracted to just women, can be attracted to all people, which would make them pansexual. Uh, they can be attracted to uh, men and women, which make them bisexual. So you get the point. These are two separate concepts. They shouldn't be conflated. Um, let me see. Cisgender is just basically describing anyone who identifies with the sex they were assigned at birth. The vast majority of people in this room are cisgender. Um, or at least, uh, you know, maybe there are folks in the closet who are waiting to come out, but, you know, almost everyone in this room is essentially cisgender. Um, Cishet describes someone who is both cisgender and heterosexual, and we all know what heterosexual means in here. Um, one more thing, and this is kind of, you know, annoying, but I have to point it out. Um, transgender is an adjective, not a noun. So when you're describing someone who's transgender, you don't say that transgendered person. You say, uh, are transgendered or transgenders, say the transgender person. Um, often this will be used as a slur in much of uh, conservative media. Not all conservative media, of course, but some outlets are a little transphobic, they tend to do that. So just make this distinction, follow it away in the back of your mind, just something to keep in mind. So I joined the military, and I joined, first of all, because I felt an incredible need to serve my country. Um, it was 2005, I just graduated from high school. The death toll in Iraq had hit 1,000. And I w felt very guilty that there were 18-year-olds my age who were serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I was very much against the war, but I felt this need to serve. My you know, past generations of family had served, and I wanted to be part of that tradition. And so I joined the military. And uh, not only did I join the military, but I went infantry, which is just the, the most hardcore aspect of the United States military in general. Um, it's you know everything that you've ever seen in war movies, sleeping in the woods and you know raiding houses and just all that stuff. So um, what I found though was that the desire to rid myself of this internal um, longing to be a woman uh, it didn't go away. Now, I point all this out to say that for 30 years, I did everything right, everything right. I uh, listened to my parents, I listened to the authorities in school, my teachers, I prayed every day. Uh, I was a committed Christian back then, I still am, I still go to church every Sunday. And I served the military and I did all these masculine rites of passage, and at the end of it, in 30 years, it didn't matter, it didn't go away. Being transgender is not a choice. You don't have control over it. It just is. The only choice that transgender, gay, lesbian, bisexual people make is whether or not to come out of the closet. It's the only choice involved. Otherwise, you can't really choose. That's not how that works. Um, 
it's very important to look at the distinction of the current state of LGBTQ quality. So in 2015, Obergefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage. It's a big day, huge day. And I know most of you are, I don't know, 14 to 18 in here, but I mean, for a good decade before this, you know, same-sex marriage was one of the biggest topics in the country. And when this happened, it was monumental. Um, I was there that night in DC when the uh, White House was uh, lit up in rainbow colors. I actually know the person who um, made this happen. Uh, and I think there was a big fear in the LGBTQ community at the time that Americans would conflate same-sex marriage with the rest of LGBTQ rights. That because same-sex marriage was legalized, there would be this feeling that, oh, so it's over, <laughs> that's it. Everyone uh, you know, has rights now and we can put this to bed and don't worry about it anymore. Not the case, not the case. Um, this year, Reuters uh, released a poll in which uh, they asked uh, folks if federal non-discrimination protections exist for LGBTQ people. Now, what is the answer to that? No, no, of course not. But 50% of Americans, because of the same-sex marriage ruling, primarily thought that LGBTQ people are protected from discrimination in the workplace, uh, from public services, from public accommodations, things like that. That is not the case. In 29 states right now, in 29 states, LGBTQ people can be fired for being LGBTQ. I want to emphasize that. In 29 states, an LGBTQ person can walk into work after marrying on Sunday and have their boss tell them, I'm sorry, but you know, you're gay and that doesn't align with my company's values, so we need to let you go. And that is legal in 29 states. All those gray states right there, all the gray ones, that's where it's legal. That's where there are no protections in the books. The uh, lighter purple ones are where it's uh, legal to fire trans people. Uh, the darker purple ones are you know, where there are universal protections for all LGBTQ people. And the reason this is important is that two weeks ago, uh, there were three cases brought before the Supreme Court together. And the two of them were pertaining to gay men and one to a trans woman. All three of them were fired for being LGBTQ. This is not a theoretical thing. This is something that actually happens to LGBTQ people still. Even though that everyone can get married now, you're still discriminated against across the board, right? Um, and so next, uh, at the end of the term, uh, basically y'all's next semester, uh, we're gonna see what the Supreme Court says about this. But the fact that this is even being debated in 2019 and as to whether or not any citizen of this country can have the right to earn a living regardless of who they are is completely absurd on every level. Now, I bring this up because this is beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I mean this with respect to everyone in this room, this is the most anti-LGBTQ administration in history by a mile, by a mile. It's not even close. Uh, there are um, just a litany of things that the uh, Trump-Pence White House have done to LGBTQ people. Uh, it's not just, you know, it's not just the basics, just the, uh, insensitivity toward LGBTQ people. That's, that's another conversation. I'm talking about legal rights. I'm talking about the ability for a citizen to walk into the public square and be LGBTQ and navigate our culture and our society without harassment and violence and discrimination. So not only did Trump and Pence argue before the Supreme Court directly, uh, telling them that you know, they sided with employers and employers should be able to fire people for, for being LGBTQ, but they've done a lot of other things. Uh, there were two federal regulations proposed this summer by the Trump-Pence White House. One of them, and I'm not, making, I'm not making these up at all, one of them is that emergency shelters should have the right to deny access to trans people just for being transgender. Emergency shelters, so if there's a homeless person who happens to be transgender, this government is saying that it's fine to turn them away out into the cold, out into uh, homelessness and hunger and disease and whatnot. The other one is even worse. And when I tell people this, they don't believe it. I have to show them the, uh, the evidence. But there's a rule proposed right now by the Department of Health and Human Services led by Trump and Pence that would allow medical providers, doctors, nurses, all medical personnel, to deny care to LGBTQ people based on personal beliefs. So if a gay person or a trans person breaks their arm and goes into the emergency room and needs care, if a doctor or a nurse or whomever 
perceives them as gay and says, you know what, this is, this is against my uh, personal beliefs. I can't do this. It's against my personal religious beliefs. This rule would make that totally legal. Now think about how bad that can get. So even life-saving health care, if you're in a car crash, if you're bleeding out, if you're hemorrhaging, uh, hemorrhaging, and you're brought into the emergency room, under this rule, a doctor can just turn you away. I don't know about y'all, but that does not align with what I perceive of American values at all. Not even close. That's just the start. <laughs> there are so many things that this government is doing to LGBTQ people right now. And what's, what's so sad is that because the media environment is so saturated, because we have so many stories that are revolving around, um, uh, for good reason, you know, North Korea or the budget crisis or just all of these other uh, news stories, there's very little bandwidth to discuss the fact that Donald Trump and Mike Pence are attacking LGBTQ people mercilessly day in and day out. I wouldn't be surprised if y'all haven't seen these stories because they're just not being reported on that much. <laughs> they're not. There's no room to talk about it. Um, and this is based, of course, on a, a lot of very, very sad myths. Um, one of them pertaining to trans people that I alluded to earlier is the idea that uh, trans people are suffering from a mental health illness, which has been used by Donald Trump to forbid uh, or to ban trans people from the military. I want to be very clear about this, very, very clear. Every major medical and scientific authority validates trans people as healthy human beings, every single one. The American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, College of American Pediatrics, the World Health Organization, every major medical and scientific authority across the board. The reason that it's included in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Manual for uh, uh, Mental Health uh, Statuses, um, is essentially that there is a sense of anxiety in being a trans person navigating a world that refuses to validate the person that you are. But trans people themselves have been validated for a very long time by the medical and scientific communities. Doctors are trained on how to negotiate um, uh, uh, you know, tr uh, transgender folks and if they're going through transitioning or if they have uh, peripheral medical issues. Uh, so this has been, you know, something that's been affirmed by the medical community for a long time. Now, there are medical doctors who let their personal biases get in the way of medical care, and that's why that rule that was proposed by the White House this summer is very problematic. But overall, medical and scientific community in complete agreement. Trans people are valid. They're real. They exist. What's more is that trans people are not a fad. Uh, they are not uh, something new. Trans people go back to ancient Greece, to ancient, uh, ancient Middle East, uh, trans people have been around for as long as there's been basically recorded history. You can find trans people in every religion, every culture, every country, every race, every ethnicity. Trans people are universal across the board. If you go to Africa, if you, you know, go to Europe, if you uh, uh, go to South America, trans people can be found everywhere, just like the rest of the LGBTQ community. This is a natural thing. You can't choose it. It's not unhealthy. What isn't healthy is when we force trans people to hide themselves in the closet, uh, when we deny them public services, when we keep them from serving in the military honorably, uh, when we basically remove them from the public square and force them to live a lie. That leads to higher rates of homelessness, uh, higher rates of mental health illness, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of unemployment, which is a burden uh, in the long term on you know, the public square in general and on our government and our uh, civic infrastructure. Denying trans people validity and affirmation hurts everybody across the board, everybody. Everybody suffers when we refuse to recognize folks on the basis of their genity, uh, gender identity or their sexual orientation. So I wanna talk about the trans ban real quick, because for some reason that's still an issue. Um, when Trump tweeted out about the trans ban, he said something along the lines of, uh, our budget is uh, going to be hurt by the trans ban. Um, this is, without a doubt, a straight up lie. Uh, the Department of Defense and the RAND Institute have done a study, uh, did a study in 2016 and reaffirmed it this year, basically saying that the cost of trans people in the military is negligible at best. It's about, I don't know, $4 million per year tops. That is, you know, I mean, that's equivalent to 
25 years of funding if we were to take Trump's military parade that he proposed last year, <laughs> that was $100 million, right? Um, that's, that's nonsense. Um, of course, the medical issues are also nonsense. Uh, trans people can deploy. Uh, we can serve in any environment. In fact, we are serving in every environment right now. Uh, there are trans people in the closet. Uh, there are trans people who are openly serving, who are grandfathered in, who are serving in combat zones right now. Some of them as line officers in charge of other soldiers and other service members in general. Um, and there's this persistent idea that it leads to a breakdown in unit cohesion. Every uh, top general, every uh, you know, joint chiefs of staff, so the head of the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, all of them have said resolutely that there have been no problems with trans people serving in the military, none. They testified about this before the Senate Armed Services Committee two years ago. This is not a problem. This is someone looking for a problem to divide Americans. Americans have a lot more to worry about. Americans have to worry about uh, you know, get putting food on the table, sending their kids to college, uh, just trying to live the American dream. If you're frustrated by this, if you're annoyed by this, I agree with you, it is annoying, it is frustrating. I don't wanna be up here talking about this. I would rather uh, you know, be working toward uh, you know, something that should be far more pressing to a reasonable society, like eradicating cancer or building a more equitable financial society for everybody. We shouldn't have to worry about what, who people love or who they are or the kind of families they have. That should not be an issue at all. Um, I have four minutes left. Crazily enough, I can't believe that. Um, I want to emphasize that, you know, when I was growing up in Central Texas, <laughs> I was stuck firmly in the closet. I mean, firmly in the closet, didn't have anyone to talk to. And now that I'm out and I'm you know, doing quite well, I feel pretty good about my life. There are still 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds who are in the closet in Central Texas and across the country. And in fact, statistically, there are probably a few trans people in the closet in this room. They're probably struggling, trying to understand how to navigate this, uh, this life, how to live authentically, how to be true to themselves, how to not be a burden on others. There's this, um, this really sad argument lately that's been pushed that trans people, for example, are destroying women's sports, which <laughs> I find rather ridiculous. Uh, every major women's sports organization has come out and said that trans people have no effect on women's sports, that trans women are women, uh, the arduous process of going through transitioning, the hormones, the physical toll, uh, it kind of makes it a moot point. And yet there are people who have spent decades ignoring women's sports who have basically popped up and said that, you know, somehow this is a problem and they use it to ignore things like the Equality Act, uh, which is a piece of legislation right now in Congress that would legalize federal non-discrimination protections for all LGBTQ people. The reason that they say is that if they pass the Equality Act and it's signed into law by the White House, that it would destroy women's sports, for example, or that it would allow um, you know, uh, trans women in places where they shouldn't be. This is not a problem, folks. It's not. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A afterward in the faculty room. Um, I believe that, there we go. If you have any questions at all, and I, I don't care what it is, you know, maybe you are highly conservative and you think this is all bullshit, reach out to me, let's talk about it. Uh, it's a safe space, you can, you can reach out to me and ask hard questions and I'm happy to walk you through this. The last thing I want you to do is walk away from this engagement, from this dialogue, thinking that there are things I didn't address, either because I, um, it was you know, undermined my argument or uh, that there are things that are highly too controversial to talk about. I wanna talk about them with you, I really do. So don't be afraid to reach out, that's my email, that's my Insta Twitter if that's your thing. I hear those are going out of style for younger folks these days. Could be wrong though. Um, so thank you very much, it was an honor to speak here today and uh, I hope you all have a pleasant day.